Hello and welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 243rd episode, our guest is me. This is my 17th solo episode of the podcast. For a complete list, check the show notes. I am a 31-time award-winning journalist whose work has appeared in print, radio, online, and television. I am currently technology reporter for Wealth Management Magazine. Most recently, I was editor of the Wabash Plain Dealer, news editor of Nouveau, managing editor of the Indiana Lawyer, and city editor, opinion page editor, and editorial board member of the Kokomo Tribune. I was also a reporter at WFHB, The Times Mail, The Reporter Times, Ukiah Daily Journal, and Ukiah Valley Television. Oh yeah, and I'm also the proprietor of the podcast, The Rob Burgess Show. Subscribe to my newsletter. You can find it at tinyletter.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show, all one word. Follow me on Mastodon at newsy.social forward slash the at sign, The Rob Burgess Show. Check out my link tree at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e forward slash the rob burgess show and check out my website which is www.thisburgess.com and now on to the show hello it is me rob burgess your host your guest your everything today welcome to the rob burgess show once again you know what i mean it's been so long thank you for your patience I last put out a podcast in December 2023. It is now April 2024, and I didn't put out a podcast episode at all in the first quarter of 2024. And that is the longest break I have taken since I started the podcast in March 2016. I've been taking smaller breaks in between there but nothing that long that was the longest so i'm glad you're still here thank you for sticking with me uh welcome back you know it was just one thing happened and another thing happened and it was really just kind of unbelievable uh cascade of events and then i looked up and it was three months had gone by so anyway i'll talk about all that another time i'm sure update you with my life But just to get things rolling again here, I wanted to talk about something that I'm passionate about because I had this idea rolling around in my head. I was getting fired up about it. And I was like, you know what? I have an outlet. It's called The Rob Burgess Show. And I can just do a podcast about this. And I was like, you know what, me? It's a great idea. I like the way you think. So... Here we are, and it will probably surprise you to find out what I'm so worked up about. You know, is it music? Is it movies? Is it politics? News? What is it, Rob? Well, it's sports. Yes, sports. Might come as a surprise to many of you because you know that one of my not interests is sports. It's just not something I recreationally follow game to game at this point in my life and haven't for quite some time. If there are big games, championships, titles, tournaments, things like that, Super Bowl, World Series, you name it, I will at least be aware of what's going on because I have to be able to talk to people in the world. Like, that's a prerequisite, you know what I mean? But, you know, as far as, like, checking the box scores, no, I don't do that. And... I don't gamble, really, so I'm not like sports gambling either, which I know is an interest for some people, a lot of people. If you want to go back and hear me talk about sports, you should hear the episodes uh, with Brandon Chapman and Josh Sigler, regular guests both. Uh, They are much more knowledgeable about sports than I, and I've talked with them about that before, and and we may have covered some issues I'm going to talk about today in those episodes, so I'll put a link to those in the show notes as well. But All right, so if you want to hear me talk more about sports, which I don't do very often, but I have done it before. Um, You can listen to the episodes with regular guests, Brandon Chapman and Josh Sigler. They did a joint one a long time ago, and then Brandon has been on uh, 
five more times since then. And then also uh, Lewis Moore, who's a associate professor of history at Grand Valley State University and teaches African American history, sports history, and gender history. I don't, like I said, don't speak about sports all that often, but those probably are two places where I've spoken about at least some of the things that we're going to talk about here today before. Just as a testament to how long it's been since I recorded a new podcast, um, I actually, this is my third time recording this today. First time, I kind of stalled out and I stopped it, and then the second time, I apparently was only recording for two and a half minutes, and then it just shut off because the batteries were dead because I hadn't used it for so long. So I had to swap out the batteries, and and this is uh, take three, which is why, if you're wondering why it sounds so great, it's because this is my third take. That's why. So there was a time where I did care very much about sports, and one sport in particular, I was really into baseball. I played in my Pee Wee League baseball team, which I believe was uh, sponsored at various times by insurance companies and a mortuary in town. I had my dad's baseball glove. I used it for a long time. I collected baseball cards, uh, many of which I still have uh, in storage. I wore snapback baseball hats all the time. I was a big hat fan, still am, back in the day, and I had multiple snapbacks of different teams. I even transcribed an entire book about baseball into a notebook, which I, uh, I borrowed the book from the elementary school library, and I wanted the information in it so badly that I meticulously transcribed the entire thing into my own notebook. So I spent a long time thinking about baseball as a child. One of my favorite teams, if not my very favorite team, depending on what year you ask me, I'm sure when the Braves were doing their thing, I would have said Braves at that time. Um, but I think while this was happening, this was probably my favorite team was the Oakland athletics, the Oakland A's. Um, this was the late eighties that I first was getting into them. The duo of Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire, otherwise known as the bash brothers. They just ruled. They were so cool. They had their little like dance elbow bumping dance that they did. They were hitting home runs. You know, I didn't know about the steroids at the time. Wasn't aware. Of course, we're all aware now. I've I've talked about that previously, and that's, that's, that's another episode. But I clearly remember watching the 1989 World Series live when the Loma Prieta earthquake occurred and the feed cut out. And we zoom into Candlestick Park in the southeastern corner of this city for the first time in 27 years a world series game will be played in candlestick park the battle of the bay continues game three of the 1989 world series the oakland athletics against the san francisco giants i'm al michaels welcome to game three it's been dominant oakland pitching of course in the first two games so roger craig has made some changes in the giants lineup ken Oberfeld, the great pinch hitter will start at third base matt williams moves from thir- third base to shortstop jose uribe is on the bench pat sheridan takes over for candy maldonado in right field now the giants of course are faced with a formidable task having to win four or five in essence to win the world title It has become less uncommon, though, in recent years for teams to overcome a two-love deficit. Most recently, it was done by the New York Mets in 1986 against the Boston Red Sox, and it was done the year before as well in 1985 by Kansas City against St. Louis. So the Giants tonight will be sending Don Robinson to the mound, and for Oakland, it will be Bob Welch, and there's no designated hitter in effect in the National League Park. Let me turn now to Tim McCarver. You know, Tim, we talked in game one. The final score was 5 nothing, but there was a key early play involving Terry Kennedy dropping a throw from Will Clark at the plate. We go back to game two. The score was 5-1, to one, but there were two key plays early in that one as well. Well, you don't often think of key plays in a 5-1 to one ball game, but let's go back to the top of the third inning. Will Clark the batter. The Giants have not had the lead in these two games. A 3-2 count, a split-finger fastball by Mike Moore. Pounced on by Terry Steinbach, the Oakland catcher, but look at the tough throw that he had to complete the play with Brett Butler running between him and Clark. 
Flash forward to the bottom of the fourth inning. Dave Parker barely by inches just misses a home run. Candy Maldonado with the hesitation, allowing Jose Canseco to score, and he fails to get Dave Parker at second base. So the Oakland A's take take. I'll see you while we I found a baseball card holder that my mom had given me from uh, my closet. Recently, she brought it to me, and uh, it was Oakland A's, and it has Robbie Burgess written in felt tip pen on the inside, so no one else got any big ideas about stealing it. Even after I stopped playing watching baseball, because you know I think my interest waned in baseball in particular and sports in general when it became apparent that I would not be a great athlete probably I was very slender and small statured and just not really built for uh, contact sports certainly but I, I also my interests gravitated towards music and movies and TV shows and books you know I, I took a different direction you know I started playing trumpet and later on baritone and you know on the side i was learning guitar and was getting into like pop culture and so i, I just didn't sports be, took a real back seat i didn't really care about it at all really you know there was of course the the home run chase later on that i was i was interested in i'd be lying if i said i wasn't that was that was probably at the you know tail the tail end of my caring about it also featuring mark mcguire of course so that happened in uh, yeah 1998 so yeah i mean there was a good like 10 year period which i in which i i would it's fair to say that i definitely held baseball in particular as an interest of mine so that's that's pretty good right but you know as soon as i was like you know 14 15 i'm i'm thinking i'm, I'm reading stephen king i'm you know, getting CDs through the BMG music service. I'm, you know, we got HBO in our house, you know what I mean? So I was, I was on to other things certainly at that point, but even after I stopped really making, you know, thinking about baseball, part of my regular life, I still retained my affinity for the A's. And I love the book Moneyball by Michael Lewis, which came out in 2003 uh, later on, I also loved the movie version that came out in 2011, starting Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, Chris Pratt, and, of course, the greatest character actor of all time, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Rest in peace. But I uh, I have retained my affinity for sports stories, like storylines. You know, I, I've seen many riveting sports documentaries and documentary series 30 for 30 is a great series there's so many good ones oj made in america this is one of the best documentaries i've ever seen the last dance about the 90 chicago bulls i was also super into it around this time of course last chance you is a great series on netflix about uh, community college football players but that's like the stories you know what i mean behind the game to game you know that's what I'm really into now in my life. If, if I'm into anything related to sports currently, it's, it's that. But, you know, all through there, I've retained my affinity for an A's as a team. My favorite color is green, so I, I enjoy the aesthetic. 
I, like I mentioned, had a snapback yellow and green A's hat from when I was a kid that was well loved. I think my mom also brought that in the same shipment. So it's around here somewhere. I moved to Northern California and bought a dark green fitted A's hat. I had to get rid of that because it got uh, mildewy after a while and smashed. It just didn't look good anymore. Uh, and a couple years ago, I received this light green and white fitted A's hat as a present. And I'm wearing it right now. I love it. It's my favorite hat. I'm sure I'll buy another one when this wears out, too. I already have a couple scoped out. So I say all of that to say that I am so bummed about what is happening to the A's currently. They are in the middle of a planned move from Oakland to Las Vegas. They are playing their last season in Oakland right now. Then the next three seasons will be played in Sacramento at the home of the Sacramento River Cats, which is the triple A minor league team for the San Francisco Giants. At that point, they will not have a city attached to their name, apparently. They're just going to be called the A's or the Athletics, not the Oakland A's or the Sacramento A's. They're just A's. And that is unbelievable right there. Let's stop right there. They can't even have a city attached to their name, the only one in the whole league. And what are they, you know, how terrible must it be for the players this season? Anyway, Las Vegas, meanwhile, they are knocking down the second oldest casino on the Strip, the Tropicana, historic, to make room for the new A's stadium. I, it's unbelievable. I was just in Las Vegas and I walked right by that. And I just can't believe, you know, of course it's Las Vegas. They always knock everything down. But when I was in Las Vegas, I was bummed because I wanted to visit the, the sites, the filming locations of two of my favorite movies, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Casino. But those places, the Riviera, in the case of Casino, and Stardust, in this case of Fear and Loathing, were both defunct. They were gone. I couldn't. And it's just a shame that they have no sense of history in that town, apparently. Although I know that's what's driven its growth over the years, but seems like a waste. Las Vegas in 2020 already stole the Raiders from Oakland, and now they're stealing the A's. Like, what does Las Vegas have against Oakland? Two professional sports teams within, you know, a couple year period sucked away. And now, Oakland, with nearly half a million people, has no professional sports team, and they had multiple ones not that long ago. Um, it's incredible for its size of city. It's in the top 50 cities in America. It's the eighth big, biggest city in California. So I just, I feel horrible for Oakland. They've been through so much as a city, and this is just another blow. Uh, it's, it's just incredible what's happened there. And, and then there's the money. And there's the uh, greed, which... Uh, I will never fail to be stunned by billionaires swindling state and local taxpayers into paying for their stadiums. It's unreal. I just, I don't get it. I don't know how they justify it. You know, John Fisher, owner of the A's, has an estimated net worth, this is according to Forbes in April 2022, to be $2.4 billion. Okay. And in June of last year, Nevada Governor Joe Lombardo signed SB1, establishing public financing of up to $380 million to help fund a proposed $1.5 billion baseball stadium in Las Vegas. So more than a third of a billion dollars from the state going to build a billionaire's baseball park. But that's almost $400 million dollars from taxpayers to pay for a billionaire's baseball park who could build the entire thing themselves and would still pretty much be a billionaire or close to it. They would be more well off than you or I will ever be. 
regardless. But anyway, this the whole thing is a huge bummer, and I don't know why they had to do it this way, even if they were going to do it. It seems like there's like an, a lot of unnecessary cruelty involved in all this. And, you know, I say all that, and like I said, I haven't watched a game. I haven't, I've never been to an A's game. I probably never will now. But I, I haven't watched anything. I bought, you know, three hats over the, over the course of my life. That's probably the extent of my contribution financially. And maybe some mem other memorabilia sorted somewhere. But, man. I mean, I know sports is a business. I get that. But people have connections here, you know? And I also, another caveat I want to offer is that I am well aware that the A's did not start in Oakland. That they were in Kansas City and Philadelphia before. And other teams have, or other cities have experienced loss when losing their team. But I it would be shocked if you could find a more disrespectful way to disengage than, than how this went down. Anyway, that's my two cents on that. I am going to work really hard to get back in this, you know, back in the groove getting podcasts out i just i had to get the let out and i had to like do something to shake my bones about and this has been as good a, a thing as any i leave you with the sounds of a's fans in the stands chanting sell the team which i endorse wholeheartedly but I will talk to you soon. I'll be back. Thank you for listening. Stick with me. Subscribe. Like. Let's get this thing going.